evening again. All right, grab your hymn books and a smile. Stan, turn to page 606. We'll sing, Oh, Say But I'm Glad, after we open in prayer. Page 606. Uh, Chris, would you please open us in prayer? Amen. Page 606. Oh, say, but I'm glad. A few pages back, page 599, we'll sing Constantly Abiding, page 599. There's a peace in my heart. Oh, so kind. 
to be back in church tonight start ask never mind i'll i'll keep that joke to myself i'll just keep that one and we'll be better off for it anyway uh, it is good to be back in church tonight and thank the lord for a, a good week end to last week and a good beginning to today thank the lord for the open doors he has given us to preach the gospel amen and we praise god first of all for the freedom we have, and we're afforded to hold community meetings where we can preach the Bible, invite people to come, but to still go out house to house and give out John and Romans, give the gospel, and get into the jail and the hospital. We just we praise the Lord. Those I've prayed many times specifically that the Lord would open doors of utterance for the gospel. I've prayed it for myself. I'm grateful that the Lord's granted us multiple opportunities for many people to give the gospel and for the church to do what he's told us to do. Go and preach the gospel. Amen. And uh, Paul, Paul instructed Ephesians 6 to pray that a door of utterance would be opened, that boldness would be given, uh, meaning these things don't just happen. We're told to obey, but we're to pray for the Lord's blessing and the opening of doors. Where there are open doors, there's great adversaries. Amen. Uh, there's uh, great and effectual doors open, and there are many adversaries. And so when you have an open door with adversaries on the other side, just don't go through. No, I'm kidding. Press on. Amen. Press on. Thank the Lord for God's goodness and his faithfulness. And again, we thank him for blessing the meeting last night. We pray for fruit from that. And let's be praying uh, for the radio programs that continues to go out until we get our radio station going. The radio programs continue to go out, so please pray for fruit from those still. And, uh, and we thank the Lord again for that, that ministry and that opportunity. On the Internet, there's messages being put out there now with the messages on YouTube. We're thankful we hear back from people. They're, they're hearing, and so just pray, Lord, give fruit. And uh, what a wonderful thing to live in a country. If you want to hear the gospel, you can. That's just the truth. There's churches all over this land today that broadcast the gospel over uh, using, using technology. And so if you want to hear the gospel, you can. What, what a blessing. So anyway, all that free of charge. Uh, be, be in prayers. We've already mentioned a number of prayer requests uh, earlier. Do please pray for the, um, not only the trip to Redmond this Friday for those of, those of us who are going, but... Uh, Colton and Zeke will be leaving uh, for Zambia on the 20th, as well as the whole team headed there. So pray for the folks going to Zambia. And then I failed to mention it, forgive me, in, in uh, our prayer time, we, we have uh, one step that we can take in the direction of the container. Um, I was hearing from Brother Johnson this weekend, and so I can say more about it another time, maybe on Thursday night in prayer meeting. We'll say a little more about it, but um, there, there's a man working on it. He's filing some new paperwork, and so... Um, Brother Johnson's going to proceed with that step, so please pray over that. Pray for wisdom on his part uh, as he's having to handle those situations and then discernment and good success. It might be able to, they think there's a possibility of getting some fees waived uh, so we can still take possession of that, those contents and, uh, and pray they'll be put in the right hands and uh, that container will still be put to use, amen, and the contents of it. And, uh, and not to mention that the folks who own the container can get it back. That's what they would like, and so... There's a number of things need to be done, but please don't forget to pray over that container. And then the container going to Zambia with the, um, the materials for the campaign down there, um, was in, it was hindered by a storm. It was a storm that put it in port, so Brother Johnson's asked for those on that trip to please pray for the clearing of that in time to get the goods in the hands of the workers when they're there. So, And then, of course, be praying for good safety and health for all those involved with that. All right, let's go ahead and have our ushers come tonight. We'll take up the offering this evening. <clears throat>
All right, stand again if you would. Turn to page 642. Page 642. Ring the bells of heaven. Case will come lead us. Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today For a soul returning from the wild See the Father meets him out upon the way Welcoming his weary wandering child Glory, glory, how the angels sing Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring Tis the ransomed army like a mighty sea, healing forth the anthem of the free. Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today, for the wanderer now is reconciled. Yet a soul is rescued from his sinful way, and is born anew a ransomed child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. a mighty sea, healing forth the anthem of the free. Ring the bells of heaven, spread the feast today, angels swell the glad triumphant strain. Tell the joyful tidings, bear it far away, for a precious soul is born again. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Is the ransomed army like a mighty sea, healing forth the anthem of the free? All right, we'll turn back now to page 131. Jesus paid it all. We'll sing all four verses. Page 131. <laughs> Finding your way to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We dealt with last week 
the law of love, seen in Galatians chapter 6, we will get into the law of life or the law of the spirit of life, but I wanted to take time to pause and look at something specific that's dealt with in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, and that is the matter of self-deceit, being self-deceived. This is something we've dealt with in time past. I think it's something that the Bible addresses numerous times, so it's not uncommon then to be preaching different portions of Scripture and needing to deal with this issue. I do believe self-deception is the most subtle form. Um, it is most easy to do and most difficult to recognize, and yet we have the Word of God to help us do so. But the Apostle Paul warns in Galatians 6.3 of those who deceive themselves. If we, a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And so I want to look at a number of passages of Scripture tonight that deal with self-deception. They are written as warnings to God's people. And, uh, and so we'll dive into that this evening here in Galatians chapter 6. So have your Bibles and your fingers ready. We'll be going to a number of different places. Miss Mary's going to play. Let's ask the Lord to use the song to prepare us for the message. Galatians chapter 6, and if you'll grab your Bibles and stand, we'll go ahead and read the first three verses together, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6, and let's go ahead and read and then we'll pray. Verse 1, brethren, if a man <clears throat> be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth 
himself. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I thank you again for the day. We ask your blessing on the preaching of your word now. Lord, you've said preach the word, and as we uh, endeavor to obey that command and do so, Lord, we ask you to please bless. And in asking your blessing, Lord, what, what I ask for is clarity of mind, and Lord, singleness and sincerity and purity of heart as I preach your word. And Lord, words that are uh, true to your word, Lord, I pray that you have now blessed this time and then on part of the hearers that we would approach your word with singleness of heart. And each hearer would be ready to hear what you have to say by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of his book, the Bible, Lord, your book. We praise you and thank you for the opportunity uh, for this time. We pray for the right response to what you say to us tonight. Help us to be prepared to respond by faith and obedience and submission to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I think you may be seated. Hold your finger in Galatians 6. I want to go over to a verse we looked at last week in 1 Corinthians 13 that I think helps put what is stated in chapter 6, verse 3 in its proper context. You want to kind of understand the context in which this is being given in the context of the chapter, but also of the entire book of Galatians. 1 Corinthians 13, of course, is the, uh, it is the text on charity the chapter of charity, if you would. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. It's, I never read 1 Corinthians 13 without it baffling me to some degree because it's hard, it's hard to fathom that you could have the gift of prophecy you could understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have mountain-moving faith and still not have charity. But it's abundantly clear that's possible. The Bible says if I have those spiritual gifts but it's not coupled with charity, meaning a heart that values another person in, in relation to, meaning charity is not just love. I, I get a little finicky when and I say this about every time we come to it and people want to just quickly say, Love instead of charity. That word's there on purpose in the Bible to help us understand it is the love of God, but it's the love of God channeled through someone who's received that love and therefore knows how to give that love. We love not because people are lovely, but because we've been given love, we are responsible to give it. Amen? That's charity. So we don't give because a recipient is deserving or worthy but because we were given and to whom much is given of the same is much required. And so it's important that we understand charity. But what it says there is if I have all those things and have not charity, I am nothing. So if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. There were those apparently in this church of Galatia that thought they were spiritual. Some thought they were saved because they were circumcised. Some thought they were spiritual because they were circumcised meaning they had the trappings of Old Testament law in their bodies and they felt that that made them superior in spirituality to others, but they had not charity, meaning they had brethren with burdens that they weren't willing to lift a finger to. Remember what Jesus said about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes? He said, you heap, and I'm going to paraphrase here, so bear with me, you heap burdens on men which cannot be borne and you won't lift them with one of your fingers. Meaning you, you are heaping regulations on people to spiritualize them, but you yourselves don't do it. You're telling people to do things you don't do. And that seems to be, it's the same mentality that's in the, the churches of Galatia where they're, they're preaching and teaching that if you don't circumcise, you're not saved. I was thinking about this this afternoon when I was meditating on this text. And the Bible refers to those Old Testament commandments and laws as shadows and types. And so circumcision, Paul is not preaching against a surgical procedure. We understand that. He's preaching against people saying that was part of your salvation, that fulfilling that Old Testament covenant token of an Old Testament covenant was somehow necessary to secure your salvation. And you think about this, those things are a shadow, including the Sabbath day was, was a sign to the Jewish people between God and the Jews. The Bible says that repeatedly in Exodus and Jeremiah that the Sabbath was a sign between Jehovah God and the Jews. And those signs and symbols were a shadow, meaning there was a, the light of the gospel is shining right here in time. 
And it's shining over the cross of Jesus Christ and sh casting a shadow of the cross. The tabernacle was the shadow cast by the light of the gospel across the work of Christ on the cross. And so the tabernacle and all its instruments and the Sabbath day and all the regulatory dietary laws were all pointing to a day coming when Christ would ultimately pay for our sins. Now, when you've come through the shadow and come to the real thing, why go back to the shadow? You have the substance. And so you have in Galatians people taking folks back to the shadow of Calvary when Paul says, no, go to Calvary, not the shadow. Have the substance, not the form. And they were wanting to put on the form. Here's why, to avoid the reality. So here's what he's saying. You have a form. Some of you have a form of salvation or a form of spirituality, but you're, you don't, you're not real. When a man thinketh himself to be something and he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Let me try to illustrate it this way. If I come tonight and I walk in here and I have me a nice pair of police blue uniform pants and black shine shoes and I bought me a nice badge and it's on my a police uniform jacket and I have me a police hat and I've got me a 40 caliber on my hip and I even have one of those neat, cool things you put in your ear that make you look like you're listening to people. And, man, I am convinced that I am an officer of the law. I say, Pastor, when did you join the police force? Well, about six months ago. And I'm convinced, and I've worn my uniform so many days that I have finally convinced myself I look enough like an officer, and I've got enough people convinced I'm an officer that I am one. And while I'm in a pertain to be an officer, all of a sudden a police car pulls up and another one like, hey, here's some of your pals showing up. And they come and put cuffs on me. What's going on? You're under arrest for impersonating an officer of the law. You see, I can put it all on the form, but if I've never been duly authorized by that agency to represent them, that's all it is. It's form. It's show. It's thinking you're something when you are. I mean, you remember when you were a kid dressing up like something? I did it all the time. I dressed up like a cowboy. I dressed up like a soldier. And I didn't do it halfway. I mean, if I'm going to dress up like something, it needs to look real. So I went to army surplus stores, and I bought hats, and I bought boots. And I mean, it's, I had a holster that was real, gen, I mean, it was genuine leather. My gun looked real. Uh, you know, I scared people when I was a kid. They thought I had real weapons. They weren't real, but they looked real, right? I mean, it was a real deal. But you know, it's all pretend in my mind. It's all appearance. There are people that know how to appear like they're Christians, but they're not. You know why some of these people couldn't lift burdens for other people? They weren't what they pretended to be. They were saying they were something when they were nothing. You know what it takes to be a Christian? You have to be born again. You actually have to have received the Holy Spirit of God. You actually have to be indwelt by Him. You have to have had a point where you were truly given a new nature and the Spirit of God is living within you. Not only were there people in this church that were pretending to be saved that were not, but there were people pretending to be spiritual that were not. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14? If any man among you think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, you know what he's insinuating? Some of you think that you can speak for God and that you're spiritual, but you're not. So he said, I'm going to give you a test. Let him acknowledge that the things I write on you are the commandments of the Lord. We dealt with that when we dealt with the message on being spiritual. And so it's all in the same context. He's talking about ye which are spiritual. So what he was doing, he said, some of you think you're spiritual because you're circumcised. But the mark of your spirituality will not be circumcision, but will be lifting how you execute the law of love, not the law of circumcision. You with me thus far? So with that all in mind, that's all in the context of Galatians. We want to springboard from here and look at a number of times in the New Testament that we are warned against deceiving ourselves. Now, if the Lord warns us of something, so for instance, you're driving down the highway and you see one of those yellow signs. How many of you have graduated and got your driver's license in the last two years? A yellow sign with a curvy little mark on it, two curvy marks, two of them. Two tire tracks doing like this. Anybody know what it stands for? All right, you people fail. Not, not coming curves, two tire marks doing this. Thank you, slippery road, okay? If you saw three slippery road signs within 500 feet and you went 65 and you didn't pay attention and you slide off the highway, the officer's going to say, did you, did you see the signs? That... How about this? Yellow sign with a picture of a cow. 
Ask my parents what that means. <laughs> I hope they watch this. <laughs> that means there's range cattle. Now, if you're from East Tennessee, you don't have a clue what that means. But if you live in North Idaho, you know what that means. There's cattle that might be in the road, right? If you see three or four or five range cattle signs, you know what you're going to assume? I bet there's cattle around here. So when we have four and five warnings in the Bible saying, don't deceive yourself, you know what we ought to say? Ooh, we are prone to deceive ourselves. That's just common sense. When the Spirit of God took time to put multiple warning signs in multiple books over multiple issues, it ought to tell us as humans, even as Christians, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again, that we are capable, and not only capable, but we are prone to deceive ourselves. The disciples had to be, had to be dealt with and rebuked over being deceived about their own spiritual state, and so may God help us to get some help from this tonight. Now let's give you three things tonight about this the self-deception. Number one, let's address the matters of self-deceit. The matters, by that I mean, what are the categories we're warned about specifically regarding uh, self-deceit. Go up with, with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Now, there's, we're not going in the order that the books are written in the Bible, but we, we, we're going in a, in a different order that deals with a spiritual progression. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, If we say that we have no sin... We do what? We deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. We say, now, we're going to break this down because we have some folks today misrepresenting and false handling, mishandling 1 John chapter 1. There are those that call 1 John 1, 9 the, the, the Protestant or someone called the Baptist confessional booth, meaning you believe 1 John 1, 9 means you can just go sin and then just go confess it and go sin and go confess it. There are people that like to handle 1 John 1, 9 that way, but they don't understand what that verse means either, right? The person that confesses their sin wants to be cleansed and wants to be uh, uh, forgiven, right? So the, the person that would use 1 John 1, 9 appropriately is repentant. If we confess our sins, meaning God has told you this is sin in your life, confess does not mean I'm going to look myself over and try to find something and, and, and self-pronounce. It's, it's, you're not the investigator. That's what I'm trying to say. The Spirit of God's going to tell you when something in your life is sin. That's still part of your old man. That's sin. To confess means to agree or acknowledge after the fact, meaning if someone were to lie to someone else and you were to come up and say, you know, I asked you this and you said this and that wasn't true. You lied to me. To confess would be to say, you are correct. I lied. It is to acknowledge the fact of, of, of a wrongdoing. So the idea of here is be in agreement with God when he points out sin in our life. So 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 9 are in comparison, contrast to each other. If we say that we have no sin, so when God is saying there's sin, we're saying, no, I don't have any. I have none. We deceive ourselves. So here the matter of self-deception is concerning spiritual purity. Concerning purity in our lives, many times we will see ourselves pure when we are to blame. And if we confess our sins, though, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I do want us to notice, as I began to say earlier in verse 8, uh, who, can we agree on who the penman of 1 John is? Who's the writer here? This is hard. Uh, John, that would be correct. Uh, I love books like this. It's, it's John. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. So John doesn't say, if you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. He says, if we. There are many that would say, 1 John 1, 9 is written to the lost, to the unsaved. And 1 John 1, 9 is about people getting saved. You can't get saved unless you confess you have sin. I agree with that. But it's not written. How many of us understand 1 John 1, 9 is not about salvation? It's about fellowship with God. Meaning about walking in agreement and communion with the Lord. And so then, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. When someone, I read a post from a man the other day, and I kid you not, he was being serious. I don't, he's, he's doctrinally off in error. He said that he has been living a sinless life since he got saved. And I said, well, you've been telling lies, that's for sure. <laughs> 
That's on the authority of God's word. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Let's put this in context. Philippians chapter 3. If you say that you have no sin, guess what you are? Sin less. You're sinlessly perfect. If you are sinlessly perfect, you are in your glorified body. And if you're in your glorified body, that's depression. <laughs> Amen. Now, the fact of the matter is, none of us have arrived. Would we agree? We've not arrived yet. Until you get in heaven, there's going to be things God's dealing with, perfecting us, conforming us to Christ. How many of you have noticed this if you've been saved any length of time? God deals with a sin in your life that is characteristic of your old man. He deals with it. He makes it clear to you. He gives you victory. And you think, yes, and then all of a sudden you start seeing another one. Or you begin to see that same sin deeper than you knew it was there, and you have to address it in a deeper way. You might know what I'm talking about. So when you get a sin dealt with, we're not talking about living in continuous sin purposely. We're talking about growing in victory and knowing that you do not reach sinless perfection until you get a glorified body. Philippians chapter 3, Paul believed that. The Bible says this, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 9, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now notice what he says. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that which also, uh, that for which I also am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Do you get the idea of Paul saying, I, since I got saved, I've arrived? Or is he saying just the opposite? I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not yet arrived at the end of this thing, which is to be completely conformed to the person of Jesus Christ, but I am pressing toward that mark. And so what I'm saying here tonight is there are those who self-deceive and say, I have no sin. If you get to the place where God's not working on transforming something, and I'm not talking about reaching spiritual maturity, okay? Spiritual maturity has to do with how you and I respond to God's word and, and the, the fruit that's born in our lives. But I am saying this idea of the Lord perfecting that which is lacking in us and conforming us to Christ. If someone says, I've arrived, there's nothing else to work on. Someone has deceived themselves. So the first matter of self-deceit is concerning spiritual purity. People deceive themselves about being saved in the first place. Have they been born again? There are those that say, well, I'm saved because um, I don't drink anymore. Well, that's good, but stopping drinking is not what saves you. Getting saved will give you power to stop drinking. But just because you don't have a habit in your life, well, I'm saved because I went to an altar and some friends prayed and I prayed. Well, that's wonderful. I believe in sinners saying a sinner's prayer, calling on the Lord. But did you do that because you personally trusted Christ and you were communicating your faith to him? Uh, or did you do that because everybody around you was saying a prayer? There are those who are deceived. So I'm, I'm good. I, I, I'm fine. They're deceived about their purity in the sight of God. Are they a sinner saved by grace? Or there are those who are deceived about spiritual purity as it relates to sanctification in their lives. There's things that need to be worked on, things that need to be changed. And they say, I would confess sin, you know. I would make a trip to the altar or bow my knee and confess sin in my personal prayer closet, but there is none. Oh, no, that's a problem. That's a problem. And so then uh, there's deception in the matter of spiritual purity, letter B. There's deception concerning spiritual prudence or wisdom. There are those convinced that they are wise spiritually because they are wise worldly. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We need not confuse worldly wisdom with spiritual wisdom. There are those, can I give you an illustration? So where I came from in the Bible Belt, many times men became deacons not because they were godly, but because they were good businessmen. So they had attained worldly wisdom. They had, they had attained the ability to succeed in this life and had some testimony of being a Christian, and so they would get into a church, and they would be recommended to serve in some kind of a leadership capacity because they were capable of handling earthly goods. Now, I believe in right and good stewardship, so don't misunderstand. But you know what that is? That is comparing 
Apples and oranges, spiritual wisdom and earthly wisdom are not the same thing. Spiritual wisdom focuses on the eternal and on the spiritual and lays up treasure in heaven while earthly wisdom focuses on the temporal and the carnal. And Paul is going to rebuke the Corinthians because they were carnally minded. They saw things and measured by earthly measures. So the, it's what the Laodiceans did. They measured the success of their church by the size of their bank account. Praise God when God gives more than what we need. But the measure of a spiritual church is not its bank account. It's not its building. It's not its structure. It's not the number of ministries it has. None of those things are wrong if God has done that. But if we're not careful, we will use carnal measures to measure spiritual things. Someone says, well, I'm spiritual because... May I say this? You know where we stand. It is right to be faithful to the assembly of God's house. But you, I remember when I grew up, they gave... My, my dad took a pastor and they did this thing where if you didn't miss a Sunday school all year, you'd get a little badge at the end of the year. They were trying to encourage faithful church attendance. You get a little badge. <laughs> I remember a man in our church, he looked like a decorated military veteran. I mean, he, I'm not kidding. He had them this long, 27 years. He hadn't missed church, I believe is correct. I don't think I'm exaggerating. I mean no offense, the man was not spiritual. He, was, he wasn't. He was, you could ask my dad, he had the pastor of the man. He wasn't spiritual, but he did not miss church. That's good. It's a good thing to not miss church. But if we're not careful, we'll take a carnal measure and equate that to spirituality. And then we become deceived about what spiritual wisdom is. Spiritual wisdom has the ability to make decisions today. They're going to account in eternity. Amen? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says in, uh, back in verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Look at verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you, what's the next word? Seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. I Meaning if you are measuring your wisdom by this world, you just go ahead and become a, a fool so that you can actually be wise instead of think you're wise. Meaning if, if you are measuring your success by earthly standards, you're foolish already and yet you think you're wise. Throw that wisdom away and get you some spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom says, Matthew 6, that you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Spiritual things always precede and are more important than physical things. I read a quote from someone this weekend, someone I knew when I was a child. They made this statement, family is everything. I want you to test that against the Bible. I'm not criticizing that person. I am critiquing the quote. Family is everything. That sounds noble, doesn't it? It's earthly wisdom. It's earthly wisdom. Our Lord and Savior didn't believe that. He said, God is everything. Obedience to God is everything. When his mother and brethren demanded a hearing from him, he was, we would call him rude. He said, your mother and brethren are out there waiting to talk to you. And he says, who are my mother and my brethren? But these who hear the word of God and keep it. They can wait. You realize his mother at that time was under the influence of unbelieving brethren. And they wanted preference. And he said, spiritual things first. You know what he said? Away with the earthly wisdom. We're going to use heavenly wisdom. Eternal things are more important than temporal things. Spiritual things are more important than physical things. Your spiritual health, listen to me, church, your spiritual health is more important than your physical health. Be grateful for physical health. Paul died with his body a wreck from serving God. There are people that have thrown away their spiritual health to keep their bodies in shape. Huh? I know where I live. I know the part of the world I live in. They've thrown away their, their love for God and faithfulness to his word and faithful to his work because they have valued temporal things more than eternal things. We're not talking about being abusive to your body. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about priorities. And there are those who seem to be wise because they've got their life put together here by carnal measures. They are a success. And Paul said, if you think that's real wisdom, you need to be foolish so that you can be wise because you know how the world looks at spiritual wisdom? 
If you turn down a job that'll pay six figures just so you can be faithful to the house of God, you know what the world's going to call you? A fool. <laughs> I've seen men do it and seen them called fools. Not by unbelievers, but by Christians. Believers. You shouldn't be so finicky. You shouldn't be so narrow-minded. Hey, it's called living a principled life, putting eternal things first and foremost. And so... The point would be this. God warns us about deception of ourself concerning spiritual purity. If any man say that he has no sin, he deceiveth himself. Then here he says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. You know how God looks at a man and thinks he's wise because he's earned uh, 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 so much income and because he thinks his future is secure. You remember the man in Luke 12? Oh, his barns were full, so full he had to tear them down and build others. In this world, that man was wise. He had invested himself in his future on earth, and he said, eat, drink, be merry. Hey, we got, got much laid up. I don't have to work. I can take it easy for a while. And God said, thou fool. There's not a lost person in the world that would call that man a fool. Look how wise he was. He wasn't only wise enough to cultivate his ground and get some bumper crops. He was wise enough to lay it up in store and put it aside. What a wise man to prepare for more life on earth when he wasn't even guaranteed tomorrow. He was a fool because he, did not, he was not rich toward God. And so then that's foolishness. Our wisdom is foolishness with God. And so anybody thinks they're wise in this world, Paul says, and the Spirit of God says, let him come a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, verse 19, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, verse 20, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you're Christ and Christ is God's. He says, let's get things in the right perspective Get your focus on spiritual, eternal things. And so he warns us not to be deceived about spiritual prudence, about what wisdom is. Number three, he warns us not to be deceived about spiritual progress. James chapter 1, this is the most well-known of these verses, I would think. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers, what's the next key word? Only. Of course we're supposed to be hearers of the word. The key word is not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. I'll use this illustration. Let's say you said, Pastor, how do you feel about prayer and fasting? Oh, it's so important. So important. Over the last month, I've listened to 22 messages about fasting and prayer. I have written down 32 pages of notes on fasting and prayer. I have memorized 22 verses on fasting and prayer. Pastor, how long has it been since you fasted and prayed? 22 years. You know what can happen? I can get informed about a spiritual subject and think that I'm making spiritual progress. I can know doctrine, but if that doctrine does not move me to practice, you can say, I know all five texts where the Great Commission is given. Wonderful. When was the last time you obeyed it? When was the last time you gave the gospel to somebody? You know, I, I know great verses on overcoming temptation. Well, when was the last time you put them into practice and did it? I know great verses on prayer. Good. I've heard great sermons on prayer. You see, there is a tendency, and if you're flesh, and you are tonight, and I am, then you know, James 1.22 goes, oh, that resonates. I hear something, and as soon, you can hear it and say, I agree with that, and you feel like, I've done it. It's no good. I remember being in Bible college, and I remember our pastor saying, hey, when you go home tonight, sometimes the Lord would really work in hearts. By the way, when I was in that church, God was moving and working a very unique way in hearts. He really was. People that were there at the time would agree, and we're not talking about emotionalism. I was getting ready to say, the mark that the Lord had really worked in a service is it would be very, very quiet at the end. Not loud. No dancing. No tongue talking. No cartwheels. A hush. The pastor would get up and say, we perceive the Lord has really spoken to his hearts tonight. You go to your dorms. I want you to go find a quiet place be alone with God. And if God's dealt with you about something, you, you, go, you go get it into practice now. Great advice. 
So here's what I would say to you. Tonight, maybe you've been in the preaching today. The preaching has not been on prayer or on Bible reading. But let's say the Lord's dealing with you. We'll, just, we'll stay on the fasting and prayer, about fasting and prayer. You right now, you begin to find out when. But don't procrastinate. Do it. Amen? If you've not been praying like you should, can I encourage you this? Before you go home and forget what God has spoken to you about today, put everything else aside, put it into practice. I know it would be horrible tonight to go without some level of entertainment or something. No, you understand what I'm saying? If we delay, we end up disobeying because what we'll say is, oh, God spoke to me. You know this. I believe when God speaks, it is very good for us to outwardly respond, to humble ourselves, come to the altar, bow down, kneel before the Lord, humble ourselves before men even, and pray. It's good for us. It's good to acknowledge. But how many of you know a trip to the altar can, can deceive you? Well, I dealt with that at the altar. Well, what did you deal with? How am I going to implement what God spoke to me about? See what I'm saying? There is deceit many times in hearing. And if all I'm doing is hearing, hearing only, I ought to ask myself, after I've heard the word of God preached and God spoke to me, what does that mean in my decision-making process? What are the feet that are going to be put to what God has spoken to me about? So the matters of self-deceit, spiritual purity, spiritual prudence, spiritual progress, uh, but be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If you only hear and don't do yourself deceived about your progress in your walk with God. Letter D, there is deceit about spiritual power. That's what he's dealing with in Galatians 6, 3. He's talking about bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ and bearing your own burden. And in the context of that, he said, for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Meaning, you think you have spiritual stamina to bear burdens. You think that you have spiritual stamina to support others. But if you're not actually spiritual, you're not going to be able to help anybody. That's what he said. Ye which are what? Spiritual. Restore such in one. Spirituality is being strong spiritually. And if someone is measuring spirituality by the wrong measurements, they're going to think, I am spiritual. And then a burden's going to come on them and they're going to crumple under it. You know what I think he's saying? Some people have fallen under their burdens because they thought they were spiritual when they were not. Because they were measuring their spirituality by carnal means. They thought they were ready for a temptation. They faced it and they fell. And you who are really spiritual need to go help those who thought they were. You with me? If we think we're strong when we're not, we think we're ready to stand up to a temptation, we think we are matured in a way many a young adult could testify, I thought I was ready for life until I went out and started living it. Boy, there's some rude awakenings in life. <laughs> and the same is true in spiritual matters. I've seen people who thought they were ready to serve in some capacity. They did not realize the spiritual pressure that comes on you when God is using you to serve other people and under that pressure just crumple. We don't want that. When they crumple, what you do is say, nah, 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 nah. no, go get them up. But the fact is we think we're something when we're nothing. We deceive ourselves. That has to do with spiritual strength, spiritual power. And then finally, there's deception in our lives about spiritual piety, religion, if you would. Go, if you would, James 1.26. James 1.26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. This is coupled back to verse 22. There are many who can talk a good spiritual life without living it. I remember, I'll be very careful with this illustration, but I remember one time someone who would tell me almost every time I saw them, I am a fully surrendered person. I mean, they would make a big deal about how they surrendered to God every day. And I'm just going to be honest with you, it bugged me. Because, here, let me ask you this. If every time I met you, I said, I just want you to know I really do love my wife. I really want you to know how much I love my wife. I'll, just be, I'll be frank with you. Men who go around always boasting about how much they love their wives, I think, no, you don't. See, you are such a cynic, Pastor. No, I'm not. I'm a realist. If you love her, you don't have to tell anybody you love her. Everybody will know. There are men in this room, I know you love your wives, and you've never told me you love your wife. I just know it. Your life tells it. The fact that you care about them and notice and remember details and take time off to spend with them and 
you're not always trying to run away from them, but spend time with them. Ah, that's good. It means you love your wife. But if you went around telling everybody, I love my wife, I love my wife, oh, I love, I got a bumper sticker on my truck that says, oh, I love my wife. When I see people that, you know, they got a tattoo their truck and their shoulder and everything else that they love Jesus, I think, no, you don't. If you love him, just obey him. I think that's what God's saying. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, meaning a loose tongue means a deceived heart. A loose tongue means I've got a deceived heart. Bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own, own heart. This man's religion is vain. It's an empty show. It's hot air. Nada. It means nothing. Then he goes on to say what real religion is. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this. Not to go around talking about how religious you are. <laughs> Not to wear your badges you know, <laughs> down the air. Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from this world. Meaning you keep yourself separated from this world. Don't you conform to this world. Don't worry about running your mouth and talking about what you can do. Be faithful to God and serve people that need you to serve them. That's kind of the, the end of the thing there. And so the matters of self-deceit, these are the specific warnings we're given about deceiving ourselves concerning spiritual purity, thinking we have no sin when we do, about spiritual prudence, thinking we're wise when we're not, about spiritual progress, thinking we're going forward when we're standing still, about spiritual power, thinking we have strength that we don't, and about spiritual piety, thinking we are godly and religious when we're not. And so matters of self-deceit. Number two, the manifestation of self-deceit. How does this show up in our life? Self-deceit, and maybe I could have titled this a little better, but it begins this way. It starts with false persuasion. I believe something about myself that's not true. So notice how these verses are worded. In Galatians 6, 3, the Bible says, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, meaning I have processed in my mind, this is what I am, but I'm actually not. That's a persuasion. I've come to a belief concerning myself. I've come and I've made a judgment. I believe I'm a spiritual person. I believe I have spiritual strength. I believe I'm going forward. So it starts with a false persuasion. Then that results in false perceptions. Notice how many times he said, if this seemeth to be the case, right? So he says this, again, we'll read these verses, 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Let no man deceive himself. If a man, any man among you, seemeth to be wise, meaning there's the appearance of wisdom, but the substance is lacking. And so when you think you're wise, then you'll project yourself as being so to others, and it will seem so. You realize this is why the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 7, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You realize God has definitions to his terms. God, you realize God has defined, so I went to the message on spirituality. The Bible, the Holy Spirit of God has defined spirituality for us so we can measure ourselves against his definition. If I, may I say this, if any man in this room tonight says, you know, I think there are things in the Bible that are not really the word of God, you're not spiritual, period. If you think any part of this book is not directly from the mouth of God, you're not spiritual. You may be saved, but according to God's measure, if that's what I think, I'm not spiritual. Because that's God's litmus test. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, one of. If my spirituality is about making a name for myself rather than serving others, it's not spirituality. Galatians 6, 3. We define that from God's word. And so what happens is, we'll get into the minute, when we have false measures, we come up with false persuasions. We've heard much about the so-called revival over in Kentucky. Um, when you measure what's going on there against the word of God, I'm not telling you people aren't sincere. I'm not telling you people aren't emotional, but I am telling you that's not a move of God. Say, Pastor, how can you say that? Because it doesn't match what God does in Scripture. You cannot say the Spirit of God is moving people to be sensual, immodest, ungodly, and out of control. So those services were controlled. They were well... No, no, no. That's just nothing more than a, a charismatic movement. Videos of people speaking in tongues and dancing in church in a sensual way. And that's not the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, it's just the fruit of the Spirit is temperance. 
I didn't say melancholy, temperance. I mean, you don't, I mean, I've heard Spirit of God moved. People were just jerking all over the floor. And I didn't see any of that coming out of Asbury, by the way. People laying on the ground, jerking, laughing uncontrollably. That's not the Lord because it doesn't match what the Word of God says. So when you have false measurements, you come up with false persuasions. We'll deal with that in just a moment. So the first thing happens is you get a false persuasion that produces false perceptions. Again, James 1, 26, if any man among you seem to be religious. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet, meaning you've persuaded yourself, God has called me to proclaim his word. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And so false persuasion leads to false perceptions, and then that leads to false proclamation. 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, you realize what happens. What I believe in my heart, in my mind, in my heart about myself, and I perceive to be so, I begin to say it so. I perceive myself to be pure, I'm going to say I'm pure. I perceive myself to be spiritual, I'm going to say I'm spiritual. I perceive myself to be a religious man, boy, I am faithful in so many areas. Bridle not my tongue, it manifests it's what I believe here and think here comes out here. You see how that's worded in Scripture? If any man say, I have no sin, uh, if a man, any man uh, seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, so the manifestation of self-deceit, it ends up coming out. It starts with a persuasion that forms a perception that becomes a proclamation. Give a person who thinks they are spiritual long enough that's not, they will tell you they are. Amen? And so then, we're not, that's, that's, that's not God's way. And so that's the manifestation, manifestation of self-deceit. If, by the way, if someone thinks they are sinless, do you think they can keep that to themselves? No. They always tell somebody. I mean, you have to post it on Facebook or write it in a book. I know of a man, his wife, they wrote they'd had a perfect marriage for 20 years. Once again, you call me a cynic, when I read that, I'm done. Because that is against God's word. The only way to have a perfect marriage is to have two perfect people. Amen? Yeah, that's the truth. And so what I'm saying is he, he believed it. He actually thought he had a perfect marriage. So he stated it. You realize boasting is sin. How many times do you find Jesus going around saying, I'm sinless? I want you to find me one scripture where Jesus told anybody he was sinless. But how many of us know he's sinless? It's recorded in the pages of scripture. But he never went around saying, even though he is. He didn't went around boasting. Oh, I've been tempted just like you, but I've not done the stuff you have. No, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Do you know who witnessed to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus' sinlessness? The Holy Spirit of God. He has witnessed on his behalf. Christ never boasted, though he could have, and it would have been true. And so the point is, when we are falsely persuaded of something, it will come out as boasts. We won't be able to bridle our tongue. And so then finally, uh, the measures of self-deceit. How do we end up getting deceived? I don't think anybody in this room wants to deceive yourself. I sure hope not. But chances are we either have been or are. <laughs> at some point in time. And so what are the measurements of self-deception? Number one, we already addressed this, but we get self-deceived by comparing ourselves to the world and to other people. So a false comparison, we dealt with that in 1 Corinthians 3, this matter of, of false wisdom. Uh, the Bible says again, 1 Corinthians 3, 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Meaning we compare Instead of, as the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 2, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Remember that verse? We're to compare spiritual things with spiritual. But instead of comparing spiritual things with spiritual, we compare spiritual things with carnal. And so then, this is how you get to the point where you say, so-and-so has been, and please don't understand this. I believe a person that won't be faithful to church is very clear they're not spiritual. But you can be faithful to church without being spiritual. <laughs> This is not true. You can give in the offering. I don't think a spiritual person will not be a giver, but you can be a giver without being spiritual. And so we would look at the world's measurement of success and use carnal measurements to compare and 
measure against spiritual progress. That doesn't work. We are to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Meaning, if you want to know the definition of something, don't let's don't go to the world and get their definition of love and compare it and say, well, then I love because I'm like the world loves. The world is all messed up on what love is. They don't understand forgiveness. They don't understand reconciliation. They don't understand restitution. They don't understand any spiritual things. Yet they use all our terms. And we're going to get in trouble if we let the world define, the lost world define spiritual terms for us. We don't determine spirituality by measuring against carnal things. May I say this? I'll give you one more illustration. I hope I'm not misunderstood tonight. We believe in being godly, having a good tongue. Have you ever met somebody who was lost as a goose in a snowstorm spiritually, but they never cursed or swore? Well, of course. Some do it for business. Some do it because they were trained that way. Now, we know a spiritual person will not use corrupt language. But you can't say because somebody doesn't cuss that they're saved and spiritual. We don't use carnal measures we use spiritual measures, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. When you know that person says, you say, well, I notice you don't use God's name in vain. They say, you know what? God is my Savior, and I wouldn't want to use his name in vain. Ah, now we're spiritual. You see what I'm saying? Well, I notice you don't use God's name in vain. No, I don't. It's bad for business. It's not becoming of my position. That's not spiritual. So We, we get deceived when we use false measures, when we use carnal measures, to measure against spiritual things. And so comparison, false comparisons of the carnal to the spiritual, okay? And then secondly, the measures of self-deceit is just simply conceit, pride. I am willing to believe the best view about myself. I'm willing to accept the best view possible of who I am. I know what I'm supposed to be, so I'm going to build a case for myself that I am that. Just self-conceit. The Bible says that uh, a man is, there's more hope of a fool than a man that's wise in his own conceit. So to be conceited means I have a concept of myself that I have formulated, I've built, I've built my little straw house, and I'm going to stand on that. And so Galatians 6, 3, it's just apparent. If any man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. He, he's just conceited uh, very, very clearly. And oh, how we're prone to this. First John 1, 8 uh, attests the same thing. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. How can a person get to the point they think they have no sin? You just got to be building a false view of yourself in your own mind. It's called conceit. It's called pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and in a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is really having a dishonest view of self. Is that not what pride is? A dishonest view of oneself. And so the last thing, comprehension, um, meaning I think I'm spiritual because I know a lot, a lot of spiritual things. So we're talking about the measures. What, what are the measurements of self-deceit? How do you get self-deceit? Well, you measure your spirituality. You measure your purity or your prudence or your progress by comparis, comparing carnal things with spiritual things. You do so by simply imagining that you are. That's conceit. Or you do so by, by exchanging real obedience for simple comprehension of truth. I know a lot of spiritual things. That means I'm spiritual. None of those are a true measure. Amen? Jesus said, if you love me, memorize my commandments. <laughs> Keep them. Amen. Do them. Do what I say. And that's the measure. And so let's conclude here. It's not a, an alliterated point, but what can we take away from this? Okay, if we don't, if we don't want to be self-deceit, then we have to reject the wrong measurements of spirituality. We don't measure our spirituality by comparing to carnal or worldly things, worldly wisdom, we don't do it by imagining what spirituality is and saying, that's me. We, that's called conceit. We don't do it by confusing spiritual knowledge with spiritual obedience. We don't do that. Uh, we rather have to establish, number one, the right measurement of truth. What is the measure of truth? What's the measuring stick of any thought you and I have as to whether or not it's true or false? Does it line up with this book? We measure our own thoughts and our own ideas against what God says. May I say this? You'll get assurance of salvation when you say, you know what, I am going to believe that salvation is accomplished the way God says so. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shalt be saved. And no matter how I feel or no matter what I think, that's what God says. 
and I have put my faith in the living Son of God. I've taken God at His word. It's small and wavering faith, and it's little faith, but that's who it's in. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded He is able. I'm going to take God at His word. I know I'm saved because God's word says so. Amen? Now, we have to do the same thing on the negative side. Well, I think I'm spiritual. I know this, this, and this. Well, do your actions line up with your knowledge? No. Well, then let's just be honest. And that's not where I'm at. I think I'm strong spiritually. Well, let's just measure up what God says spiritual strength looks like. Spiritual strength is used to serve. Serve others and obey God. And so let's measure against the Word of God. And so we have to establish the right measurement for truth. If I think that I'm something, if I think I'm wise, let's define wisdom God's way. If I think I'm making progress, let's define that God's way. If I think I have spiritual power, let's define that God's way. If I think I have piety, let's define that God's way. If I think I'm pure, let's define that God's way using the Word of God. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And by the way, this applies to more than the subject matter we're dealing with. I've seen people that say, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Let's make sure we're defining bitterness God's way. A lot of people that are bitter that don't think they are, they're self-deceived. They know it's bad to be bitter. They don't want to do something bad, so they said, I'm not bitter. Well, then why does the mention of that name always boil your blood? Why, why do you get this sour attitude when that subject comes up? Let's define it God's way. Because if not, we'll fail of the grace of God and many are going to be defiled. It's important that we see things God's way. What does biblical forgiveness look like? What is uh, so many of these terms? We need to know God's word and determine these things by the word of God. This is what it means that he that is spiritual judgeth all things. You're going to take what you hear, what you think, and what you feel and measure it against God's word to see if what you're thinking, feeling, and hearing is true. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. How do you prove something if you don't have a measuring stick to prove it with? This is why the Bible, listen my friend, this is why Satan attacks your Bible. God put a measuring stick in your hand to measure things, whether they be true or false. Satan wants you to believe lies, so he wants this measuring stick. He wants you not to trust it. Use something other than the Bible to measure ideas, concepts, philosophies, and doctrines against. You use something else other than the Bible. Use your experience. Use your emotions. Use your family's ideas. Use the common, uh, the common agreed upon uh, thoughts of the culture. Use anything but the Bible. Because the Bible is a lamp and the Bible is a light and the Bible is a measuring stick to measure all things by. You're a preacher, you hear the message, and you measure it against the Bible to find out if you should receive it or not. God help me if I preach to you something that doesn't measure with the Bible. The point is this tonight. We need to replace false measures with the only true measure. How many of you would like to have multiple, multiple rulers that define an inch differently? Can you imagine building a house that way? I've seen some houses look like they're built that way. <laughs> They had some levels that were off bubble. But anyway, can you imagine? Well, an inch to me is that, an inch to me is that, an inch to me is that. And I got three different rulers that measure it differently. Well, God gave us one measuring stick, and it's his word. Amen? So we must establish the right measure of truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So establish the right measurement of truth. Number two, we're just talking about our conclusion. Reject comparisons that are, that are faulty. Don't determine spiritual truth by carnal measures. <laughs> we don't do that. This is exactly, we'll, we'll conclude here in a few minutes. It's exactly what Paul is dealing with in 1 Timothy 6. It was a false measure. He said, there are those that will say gain is godliness gain is carnal physical godliness is spiritual and they said here's an equating term gain equals godliness and paul says no you're taking something physical and saying it equals something spiritual that is not true godliness with contentment equals great gain god's good at math <laughs> and he wants terms that are equivalent terms 
Isn't it amazing? We would flunk people in mathematics for saying 2 plus 2 equals 7. But in spiritual things, you're supposed to think that carnal gain means you're godly. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have to define things God's way. So we have to reject physical comparisons, carnal comparisons to spiritual things, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. We must reject apathy and complacency. Say, so why do you say that? Because it's the only thing to do if you're not going to deceive yourself by being a hearer only. <laughs> We must say, I refuse to ingest God's word without obeying it. I refuse to hear the word of God applied to my life without putting it into action. So when God stirs my heart and deals with me about my responsibility to get the gospel to somebody, I'm going to go back there before I leave this building and get me some gospel tracts so at least I have a conversation starter. When I see somebody and I have the opportunity to speak to them, I'm going to try. I'm going to say something. Why? To be a doer and not a hearer only. It does no good to quote Matthew 28, 19 through 20 if my shoe leather isn't burnt taking the gospel to somebody. Be a doer. Say, I'm not praying like I should. Well, then chalk you off 15 minutes tonight before you go to bed and have some time for prayer. Refuse to have apathy in your life. Refuse to be complacent and take in the word of God and never obey it. If you've been born again, Get baptized. If you've been baptized, get faithful in church and go and help somebody serve the Lord and find some way to use your spiritual gifts and invest in somebody. I think it's better to start doing something way less than perfect than to not do it at all. Amen? You start praying, you'll be horrible at praying, but practice will get you better. Amen? So on and so forth. Uh, so re reject and refuse apathy and complacency. Be a doer of the word. Proverbs 14, 23 said, In all labor there's profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Can we encourage you something? You need to go to the altar and say something the Lord do, but don't tell him you're going to do something not do it. Just do it. <laughs> if God's dealt with you about some area of obedience, just go ahead and start doing it. He'll teach you how. I, that's a lesson the Lord's had to teach me because I'm one of these guys who can sit there and say, well, when I know I can do it perfectly, I'll start doing it, and you never do it. So start imperfectly and grow. Amen? Start imperfectly and grow. And so be a doer, not just a hearer. And then fourthly, cast down false thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says, uh, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons, but though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Does that mean imaginations about who I am and what I am? Oh, absolutely. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When you realize you have a thought that is inconsistent with what God says, reject it. I think I'm this, but that is not the way God defines it. Then reject that thought and start over with his word. Amen. Casting down what? imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. You notice in Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are, what's the first thing he says? True. The first thing we need to judge about what we're going to think about is it true. What sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, what sort of things are pure, and what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't entertain thoughts that you know aren't true. Amen? Cast them down. Fifthly and finally, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Speak little, do much, right? Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We need to hold our tongues, not talking about ourselves. Be sure we're talking about the Lord. Be sure that we're not boasting. Hold that tongue until you've checked with whether or not what you're thinking is true. Oh, how true this is. How many of us need some help in that department? Oh, my, it's so easy to be swift to speak, slow to hear, and swift to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You know, what the, you know what is the foundation of wrath? It's pride. I've got to defend myself. You made me look bad. You made me, you, you embarrassed me in public. Uh, you know, we get all hot-headed. No, no, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Very practical message tonight, but it's right where we live. It is so easy to be self-deceived. We're not going to be deceived. We've got to measure our thoughts, our attitudes, uh, our perceptions of self against what God says. Let's not establish false measures. 
measured against the truth of God's word, and then when we find out what we think isn't true, cast it down, replace it, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Let's stand if you would please. I hope this is helpful tonight. Heads bowed and eyes closed.